Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome you to today's uh, webinar. This is uh, the first webinar in our telehealth series and our topic today is behavioral health. My name is Jessica Dyer and I'm the Behavioral Health Project Director for the California School-Based Health Alliance and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Um, I'd like to introduce our partner for the series, uh, the Telehealth Policy Coalition, the Children's Partnership, the LA Trust, the Pacific Southwest Mental Health Technology Transfer Center, and I would like to thank uh, Molina Healthcare for supporting and sponsoring um, this series. For some um, housekeeping, I uh, want to make sure you know this um, webinar is being recorded and a recording of the webinar slides and handouts will be posted on our website in the next few days and emailed to registered participants after the webinar. I'd um, also like to let you guys know about the chat bot button at the bottom is a little blue, a little bubble, and it's blue if you click on it, and then um, that will open up a chat box on the right of your screen, and that's what we'll be using um, to gather participation throughout the presentation. Um, feel free to send in questions um, as they come up for you. Uh, we'll be keeping track of them and trying to address, address as many of them as possible at the end. Uh, if we can't get to everything today, we are going to use the questions that come in to inform what information is needed in upcoming um, webinars. Uh, we'll also be using the chat box to post resources um, that you all can use. And I just want to take a moment and acknowledge the time we're in and the digital overload that's present in all of our lives right now. Um, and just allow a moment for us to ground ourselves uh, right here. Noticing your feet, feeling the support of the chair, noticing yourself in space, letting your eyes look around and allowing yourself to take a breath with ease. And I want to encourage you um, to take care of yourself during this webinar. Have water next to you, be in as comfortable a position as possible, it might be Standing, sitting, moving around, um, whatever feels most supportive. And lastly, I want to encourage you to um, take what you need from this webinar. It can be helpful to focus on finding two to three takeaways that resonate with you and know that there will be a lot of resources moving forward uh, to support this work. This is the first um, webinar in our telehealth series, um, and we really uh, I want to appreciate all of the questions that were submitted um, for today. Um, and some of those questions were around um, billing and reimbursement, and as well um, as about telehealth platforms. And uh, next week, we will have a webinar on Tuesday, May 19th, um, specifically focusing on billing and reimbursement. And then on Thursday, May 21st, we'll have a webinar I'm talking all about telehealth platforms. So for um, really detailed answers to questions on those topics, please join the web those webinars next week. There were also um, some questions about HIPAA and FERPA. And in the chat box, um, I've linked a, uh, to one of our um, sources that um, go over HIPAA and FERPA um, a lot, and we will have a compliance webinar covering HIPAA FERPA coming up in, in early June. We don't have the exact date yet. Um, and I also am linking here the uh, handouts um, that will go along with today's um, webinar. And I'd like to uh, again thank Molina for um, healthcare for supporting this series. Uh, we are the uh, California School-Based Health Alliance, and our mission is putting healthcare in schools. Our work is based on um, two concepts, that healthcare should be accessible and where kids are, uh, and that schools should have the services needed to ensure that poor health is not a barrier to learning. We do this through capacity building, technical assistance, workshops and webinars like today, uh, and on the screen, you can see a link to our website where you can find recordings, slides, and register for the other telehealth um, webinars. Uh, as a member of the California School-Based 
uh, Health Alliance, you get conference registration discounts, number only tools and resources, and technical assistance tailored to your organizational needs. Um, and on the screen, you can see a link to sign up. Um, and now I'm going to introduce our um, speaker uh, for today. Uh, Elizabeth Morrison is a uh, licensed clinical social worker with a master's in addiction counseling. She's a practicing clinician and providing services to Medi-Cal and uninsured patients in a primary care clinic. Elizabeth has been providing services via telephone, video, and text since the shelter-in-place order began. She has over 15 years of experience in developing effective and sustainable integrated behavioral health services in primary care organizations. Starting behavioral health services at a large FQHD in California in 2004 and writing the first widely distributed how-to manual on IBH. A thought leader in the field, Elizabeth has also served on integrated care advisory boards for the California Primary Care Association and the UCSF School of Medicine. She is an expert motivational interviewing trainer and has been providing research-based training and trained the trainer courses in MI and other empathy-based communications for healthcare professionals for over 20 years. Elizabeth is the co-creator of the Institute for Healthcare Communications most popular workshop, The Empathy Effect, Countering Bias to Improve Health Outcomes, which was rolled out in the United States and Canada. She has dedicated her career to working for and with nonprofit safety net health organizations, including community clinics, Medicaid health plans, philanthropic health foundations, and other social justice-oriented nonprofits. Elizabeth is the CEO and one of the principal consultants of EM Consulting, Inc. And we're very grateful that she's um, with us today and uh, going to be providing the um, webinar. I'm going to pass it to her. Hi, everybody. Do I have it now, Jessica? Yes. Um, okay. Yes. Yes, I do. Okay, I was just testing it out. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much, Jessica, for setting up the webinar for the introduction. And just thank you so much for asking me to do this. And I want to thank Sierra, too. Um, she's here providing support to make sure everything works, which I told her always makes me feel much safer when there's someone on like that. So thank you. And also to Melina uh, for sponsoring this. Um, uh, I'm happy to be here with all of you. The, as I'm watching participants hop on, there's 78 of you. And I wish I could see I wish I could see all of you. Before this webinar um, started, Jessica and I were just chatting about what, a, what you know, we're sort of all living in right now. Webinars are always challenging because it, you know it's hard not to be able to see faces and interact more freely. Um, so, particularly because I feel like there is such a kind of virtual digital overload right now, I'm just really appreciative that you all signed up to spend um, an hour here uh, with us today. So, thank you. Oops, sorry. Um. I wanted to, so I'm going to talk about telehealth stuff, and Jessica shared with me um, questions that many of you have submitted and were interested in talking about, and some of them in some ways like fit more with the other webinars in the series. Um, I picked up some of them, and I just wanted to sort of start by saying I don't, I definitely am not coming at this as sort of an expert thinking, you know, that I'm sharing all my expert knowledge with all of you. I'm a fellow uh, telehealth practitioner at this point with all of you and all of the rest of us in the helping professions and um, am using myself as my own lab, um, just like you all are, and figuring out um, what seems to work and what doesn't work so well. And like Jessica was sort of opened with um, this encouragement to take care of ourselves. And I'm figuring out how to take care of myself where I can still be at my best with the people that I'm seeing. Um, so on that note, I really wanted to encourage all of you that as I'm talking, if you have questions that come up and not just questions, but if you have comments or experiences that you want to share, please do that. Um, I'll pause again to inquire. We are watching the chat. Jessica and Sierra are watching the chat. We're going to leave time at the end for some discussion. 
Um, so I uh, would love to hear from you in terms of your own experiences in these areas as well. I just want to give a shout out to the work that you all do. Um, I'm, I'm from Alaska and I, about 15 years ago, um, I grew up there and when I was about 35, I got recruited by Golden Valley Health Centers, which is a, a really large FQHC in the Central Valley of California where I had never been. And I got recruited to start Behavioral Health Services. And this is Rob Road, which is one of Golden Valley's, they have sort of 30 or 35 clinics or something. And um, Rob Road is one of their three or four school-based clinics. And as the director of behavioral health, I always saw patients as well. And three days a week for the last two years that I worked at Golden Valley, I was working at Rob Road. And when Jessica called me and told me about the School-Based Health Alliance and um, the community that they serve and all of you doing work in schools uh, across California, I just, it just took me back. It took me back to the work that I did at Rob Road. And um, I just appreciate so much the work that you're doing. It's, so, it, um, it's just so much about um, helping people where they're at. And I know that you almost have double roles um, because I remember feeling like I was sort of the unofficial EAP of the teachers and sort of held that piece around the emotional wellness, around the school community, the kids, their families, you know, the teachers, the staff. And so I truly appreciate the work that all of you do, um, right down to the fact that my daughter two years ago in junior high um, accessed therapy through her junior high and just had a great experience. And I was so grateful. Um, that, that you all were there, so thank you. I just wanted to tell you, this is in Modesto. I live in the Central Valley now in California. Um, this is me on March 3rd, my son's birthday in Santa Cruz. So this was the last time that we <laughs> left the house, it seems like. The last time we were sort of out and about when things felt sort of normal. Um, and that, that wouldn't be a special picture otherwise, but now I look at it and think, oh my gosh, was this, you know, five years ago? Um, well, no, it was a couple months ago in Santa Cruz. And this is my life now. Um, I took this picture a few weeks ago and I have been sharing it just because I've been sharing it as a snapshot of my life because it so captures what my life feels like right now, which is. I'm at home working, my husband is at home, my son, my, I have a daughter here at home. This is 11 o'clock in the morning. I had been working all morning and I had come out and seen them still like not dressed in their pajamas. My son was like moaning about how much he hates school. Um, my husband was trying to figure out my son's math, which is still totally impossible, forget it. He was completely demoralized. There's like laundry on the couch. And the picture is worse than it even looks because what, what you can't see is that there was a bag of hot Cheetos at my husband's feet. And so I said, is that what Dash ate for breakfast? I just felt like, ah. Um, so I went back, went back to work. But just this feeling that like the things happening in this house, like my kids are like eating, you know, crappy food and I don't know how they're doing with school. And um, so just to acknowledge this, this moment that we're in where some of us are, you know, um, a therapist who are working in other settings might be in an office still when they actually want to be at home. I know almost all of you are at home. Some of you might rather be at work if it was possible. Um, some of us want to be at home. We didn't necessarily, you know, know it was going to involve work and kids and everybody else there as well. Um, but just to acknowledge that this is such a, a different and um, stressful time uh, for, for many of us. And, um, and this, is, this is the place where we come together today. Um, there's a, out of the things that Jessica sent me, um, there were three things that sort of seem like themes that I wanted to talk about today. And the first one is engagement which of course is always, I mean, we're, we're therapists. This is always a huge issue is, um, I, I wouldn't even say a huge issue. It's, it's such the core of what we do. How do we deeply connect and engage people in a partnership where we can be helpful to them? And there are particular challenges now. There are particular challenges, of course, with having to use the telephone or having to use video not being able to, you know, connect while they're at school. Um, for me, where I've worked in primary care as a behavioral health provider now for 15 years, 
you know, where the patients are sort of there already. Um, so what, what are the particular challenges at this time and what are the sort of practices that were true when we could see people in person and are even more true now and which ones are, are, are different at this point? Um, and the next one is confidentiality, which has gotten really complex, not just confidentiality, but just privacy. Many of you had written in questions about that. Um, emergencies, a huge clinical issue, I think, for all of us. Um, how do you handle emergencies? How are people handling emergencies? Um, and then I just put other with a question mark just for continued sort of um, encouragement to, to chat in things that you would like to talk about. One more picture from my personal life. This is my mom. She's 80. That's her boyfriend. But every time I say boyfriend, she says gentleman friend because he's 85 and she thinks it's like so undignified to call him a boyfriend. Um, so they met on a dating app just as an aside. Um, I, we got my mom an iPhone and literally like two weeks later she was on a dating website for seniors. <laughs> anyway, they're really in love. So that's a happy story. But um, uh, the reason that I have this picture of her up is I wanted to talk a little bit about empathy. Um, I, I was, as I was listening to my bio, I was thinking two things. Number one, or my introduction that Jessica committed two things. Number one, it's way too long. Um, sorry about that, Jessica. And number two, um, there's all of these, like I can hear the word empathy through it. Um, uh, most of my pre professional career now is around empathy, empathy research, empathy practices, and public communications. And I know um, as fellow therapists, um, thank you, Carl Rogers, that is really the core of our field. We don't have a stethoscope, we don't have a prescription pad, um, we don't have, you know, tables where people do particular exercises. We have ourselves and our ability to connect deeply and provide a field of empathic care where people do not feel judged and they feel totally accepted. And within that field, um, they can speak freely to us about their struggles and contemplate changes um, in a way that they wouldn't be able to if they felt judged. So it's such an important part of our field. And the connection here to my mom is that my mom loves me, of course, right? <laughs> of course she does. She, she totally loves me. Uh, she loves my son, who was in the previous picture. Um, her ability to successfully convey empathy and lack of judgment is really low. Um, and to the point that, you know, my son, I have this picture in my mind of my son coming in um, to my mom's house with like road rash on his pants and like skin knees and crying because he'd fallen down in her driveway it was a few years ago. And he walked in with that little kid just like, ah, you know, and we were both, we were both right there near the doorway and she turned to him and she said, you shouldn't have been running in my driveway, which I'm sure half of you are like laughing right now because I was raised with a, like, I'll give you something to cry about. You know, she's kind of old school. Um, and so in some ways I sort of make light of that. And in, in another way, it's a really, really serious issue because my son doesn't feel close to my mom. He doesn't really like to go over there. He wouldn't talk to her if he was struggling with something. And it's really because of course she loves him, but she actually doesn't convey that in a way that feels accepting and loving. Um, he feels judged and criticized by her largely. And as a result of that, they just don't have a close relationship and, um, you know, doesn't want to go over there. And it kind of breaks my heart because she's my mom. Um, but what, what I think about is the fact that we all are, yes, we're empathic people. That's why most of us got into this field. Um, you know, we were probably like the little kids who were like super um, connected to animals and caring of other people and stuck up for those people who we felt like, you know, were being, you know, criticized or bullied. And um, so we all have that. And, and we spent our professional life becoming increasingly skilled at being able to convey that in a way um, that we can successfully really deeply help people. Um, so it isn't enough just to feel empathy or it isn't enough just to feel caring. For us, it's a professional discipline. It's a professional obligation to continually become more and more skilled at being able to convey that effectively. So I just wanted to um, 
talk a little bit about what empathy has to do with um, what people share, what people self-disclose to us. And this relates to emergencies as well as just normal care in um, at any given time, but certainly virtually, which is people um, will pick up what we have, if we think about judgment as the opposite of empathy, judgment's the opposite of empathy. So the more empathy we're feeling, the lower judgment we're feeling. When we're feeling kind of judgmental about people or about behaviors, our empathy will be low. So if we think about it kind of like a seesaw, um, when we have judgments about something, often we'll find that we don't get self-disclosures about that. People pick that up in all kinds of ways and don't disclose those things to us. Um, and this becomes particularly important when we think about the telephone, where we've lost all of our ability to convey care and acceptance non-verbally, and even on video, um, where we lose some of our ability to connect deeply with people if we don't do things that sort of mitigate that, is we can start to notice that people's self-disclosures about how they're really doing and how they're really thinking go down. Um, and by the same token, when we're on the other end of that, right, we are also kind of constantly assessing the people around us for whether they're going, whether they have judgments about something or whether they're very accepting about something. And we tend to make decisions based on that in terms of what we'll talk about. So as therapists, like our job is really to constantly be looking where we do have judgments or bias and trying to unwind that and um, unlearn it so that we can become increasingly accepting and empathic for a wider and wider range of people and behaviors. So that, um, that piece, that empathy piece is the, is the core of engagement. It, it always has been the core of engagement and how we work when we were in person with people, particularly for all of you who are working with um, adolescents, they're particularly, they have a, like a very, very particularly heightened um, sensitivity to being judged and what people might have judgments about. So they're constantly monitoring for that. But even those of you who are working with smaller kids know this. And so now it's one, it's, it's still the most powerful tool for engagement. However, we may actually have to articulate it more. So whereas before maybe our facial features or just our tone of voice or the way that we were smiling at people. Maybe all of those things conveyed empathy enough that people really wanted to engage with us. Um, but now I know I'm doing almost half the sessions on the phone and I have to actually narrate that. So I have to actually say things like, um, you know, I just want you to know I'm not judging anything that you're telling me right now. Just as an example, whereas or I might not have had to articulate that before. And even on video, because on video, we're not actually making eye contact. I'm looking at your image and you're looking at my image, but our eyes are not actually meeting. Um, even on video, we, we typically have to articulate more. Um, that I'm really feeling for you about this and I just want you to know I don't have any judgments about this or um, it's really common for people to feel like you're feeling and thank you for telling me that. All of these things we may have to articulate more. Um, the increased attention to process is related to this, which is one of the things about virtual care that I've noticed is that I need to in, uh, spend more time checking in about the process. So I find myself saying more often to people on the phone or on video, hey, can I check in with you for a minute and just see how this is feeling for you to talk about this right now? Now, often we do that in therapy sessions in person. I'm finding that I have to do it more to, to sort of check in and see how people are feeling and how they're receiving me and really encourage them to let me know. Often I say, I know this is still a really new way for us to interact, or I'll say, I know it's really challenging when we can't see each other's faces, you know, if we're on the phone, um, just to sort of remind people, this is kind of an experiment. This is really new for us. Um, I just want to check in and see how things are going. Um, and the second piece that I think is one of my really early learnings um, about virtual care is that one way to really convey empathy and acceptance and really engage with people is to lean into the fact that they're in their home environment. 
So you right now are in my office. You can see back here. Um, earlier, before we hopped on the call, I could hear Jessica's, you know, 19-month-old, like, sort of toddling around and saying something. You know, with, with the people that we're talking to, I have an adolescent client whose brother, you know, walked back behind her. Um, the first time I talked to her on telehealth, uh, I asked her, you know, I wonder how you might feel about showing me your room. <laughs> and, you know, she was able to sort of pick up her phone and walk around um, and share with me, um, you know, that she was a little nervous about showing me certain things. And um, I saw a pride flag, which prompted this, like, um, she had not disclosed to me that, um, that she was queer. And so I asked her a little bit about it, and it turns out she, her little brother, she thinks, might be. And so she hung up a pride flag kind of proactively to show him that she had acceptance about that. So it was this really interesting conversation and it really helped me see like more of her strengths in terms of her care and concern for her brother. It just opened up um, a really um, uh, sort of an area in therapy that was very meaningful. And so as opposed to sort of acting like we're sort of doing business as normal, we just happen to be at home and we just happen to be, you know, through a computer or on the telephone, um, I've really just been leaning into the home environment, and that includes my own home environment, because our boundaries are really different right now when they can also hear our dogs barking or our kids, or um, they have more of a sense of us as real people. And so there's, um, I often have people asking me, how are you doing? How's your family doing? Um, in a way that I might not normally have had that. So I am a big believer of not acting like things are normal and of just leaning into it, you know, asking, you know, how is it for you to have your little brother behind you right now? Um, what, what is it like for you, for me to be talking to you right now in this point in time? What's it like for you to be seeing me, you know, in my office? Just leaning into it um, just to really increase engagement. Because what I noticed is when I tried to do sort of business as normal, like let's just pick up where we were, you know, the world has just kind of gone upside down since then. Um, and we, uh, we're just gonna go right back that it just almost felt inauthentic um, and that I could sort of feel the engagement weakening. Um, I just want to pause for a minute. Um, there's a, a question that came in, which is a great one that I'd like to read. Um, and then I would just like to ask all of you to think for a minute just about how you're feeling right now, how you're feeling right now just with the last 15 minutes, you know, of this webinar um, and chat in one word, one word about how you're feeling and what you're taking away um, from the last 15 minutes. Um, and I'm going to read out loud this chat from Cynthia. How do you feel about what the clinician's home background can look like? Yeah, it's such a good question. I um, Obviously, we're all really different in terms of our, or I, I shouldn't say obviously. There is a variation in clinicians in terms of our own boundaries. Right? There's a natural variation in terms of how much I might use myself in terms of self disclosure. Um, there might, there's a variation in terms of the level of separation that we have um, or closeness that we have. All can be effective. Um, I am not a fan of virtual backgrounds. I feel like they're disorienting and um, unreal. And I don't find that people are comforted by seeing indicators that everything is normal. Um, so I am dressing slightly more casually than I do in the office, um, slightly more casually. And I am, um, you know, I have a background right now, like I said, that looks fairly neutral. Our goal is for people to have confidence in us. And so the only thing that I would say we wouldn't want to show is anything that would not inspire confidence, that would inspire someone to worry about us or to question if we're able to kind of hold their emotions. So if they're looking at something that is too untidy, if they're looking at something that's too messy, if they're looking at anything that indicates it isn't private, we know, we know our clients will struggle with places to find privacy, which we're gonna talk about next. We shouldn't though, right? Or, or that shouldn't be an indication in any way. Um, so I think that's the only 
opinion I have is that ideally it's authentic, it's your real background, and that there's just nothing in it that would impair confidence in our ability to hold others' emotions. Um, oh, that's such a sweet chat. I wanted to encourage anybody else who wanted to chat something in about how you're feeling Elizabeth. Um, just in the last 15 minutes, what your sort of takeaways are. And Melissa wrote heartwarmed, which I think I love that phrase. I feel like I have to, um, I feel like the phrase itself makes me feel like that. <laughs> so thank you for chatting that in. Elizabeth, um, if it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just want to read a few of the others. Yeah, can you? Thank you, Jessica. Yeah, so um, Robert says uh, vindicated. Uh, Judith um, says validated. Um, Lily says she's feeling relief. Um, and Lance says, uh, I feel very present. Um, and Susan says she's feeling um, enlightening. So I just wanted to um, echo that uh, some of the awesome things people are saying. Thank you. So much. Thank you, Jessica. Thanks. Thank you for those of you who chatted in. Um, Jessica suggested this about sort of checking in midway, which I have not done on webinars. And I do find it challenging not to be able to sort of connect and see your faces. So in some ways, it's like I'm engaged in exactly what we're talking about, like this virtual, except that I can't get like immediate anything immediately back. So, um, so thank you for suggesting this, Jessica. And thank you for those of you who chatted in. Um, let me, um, I wanted to talk for a minute about privacy and confidentiality because that seemed to be a theme that was coming in. Um, and uh, I, I know those two things are different, right? When we talk about confidentiality, often we're talking legally. And I know Jessica shared that there's, you know, webinars coming up very specifically about that, the, the legal piece of that. Um, and I'm sure that all of you are doing the same thing that I'm, I'm not sure. Well, do, I, what I'm doing is in terms of legal confidentiality, I'm taking full advantage of the lifting of HIPAA restrictions right now. Um, I'm seeing many patients on Google Duo and Facebook video, um, the private Facebook video, not the public facing, um, because that seems to be what people have and what they prefer to use. So I'm diving in and taking full advantage of that. I'm encouraging all of the organizations and the clinicians I work with to, to, to do the same, unless they were already, unless they already had um, HIPAA compliance technology that they were able to just operationalize quickly, you know, like the Zoom and things like that. Um, I also use Zoom, but m I've noticed that most of, most patients um, don't have it, and it was a little complex to get them on it. So I just wanted to sort of separate these two issues, that there's the legal confidentiality, which has been loosened up a little bit for us, and that um, most of us, I think, who work in, in integrated settings um, or non-traditional settings, I would say like all of you in school-based, um, are not quite as rigidly risk averse um, as we find many of our colleagues who work in traditional mental health settings. When I was running treatment centers for adolescents um, in the SUD field, 42 CFR, don't get, don't get addictions people started on that, um, that there was this incredible rigidity um, that in many ways I think probably hurt patients. Um, and, and that for those of us who work in non-traditional settings, you know, we work with our health center colleagues who are all bound by HIPAA, um, but we sort of walk alongside them being bound by HIPAA and don't demand that there's, you know, further protections for behavioral health or mental health. Um, so I just wanted to sort of put that aside. And if people do want more specifics, um, just sort of a rundown of like, what are the platforms right now that are HIPAA compliant and which ones are accepted right now, even though they're not HIPAA compliant and which ones are prohibited. Um, I did make a slide just at the very end of this presentation that just has those listed out. Um, the privacy piece is different, right? Privacy is about um, uh, protecting people more emotionally and as opposed to, to legally. And what is sufficient privacy? And I just want to tell you my experience of where I've um, leaned on that, which is um, I sufficient privacy is what the patient or the client says is sufficient for them. So when I said I had a patient where their, their younger brother had walked behind them, um, I said to her, um, hey, tell me a little bit about how you're feeling about that. 
um, thinking that she would say, oh, I have to move, or she's at her grandma's house, she doesn't have her own room at her grandma's house. I was gonna suggest maybe that we go to phone and that she, I mean, just the telephone. She was on the video on her phone and um, if she could walk outside, if it was safe out there. I was getting ready to problem solve, um, but I'm so glad that I asked her first. How do you feel about that? Because she said, um, I worry about him a lot and I think he would benefit from therapy. So I wouldn't mind if he overhears this because I think he'd see what it looks like. And I thought that was so interesting. Um, so it was such a reminder to me that my concerns about privacy and confidentiality may, may be very different um, than the client's uh, um, concerns about it. And just to, to follow their lead on this. Um, often, I mean, obviously wearing headphones just for them is helpful in that it blocks half the conversation if they're not in a completely private place but also because telephone is HIPAA compliant <laughs> um, and we can use the telephone, video is in many ways preferable, um, but we can always switch to telephone, which allows people sometimes more mobility. I'm just gonna um, read one of the comments that came in. I'm often concerned about showing one's home if one might look much nicer than our clients. Many of clients are low income families. They might live in one bedroom and are just struggling to get food. Absolutely. And I have worked in, in the safety net and with nonprofits for my whole career. And so I have the same population and patient base that I think many of you do. Um, yeah, so I, I, I can understand that. I know that our patients already know that we are in that we are likely not struggling in the same socioeconomic ways that they are struggling. That they they already know that um, before they saw our our homes. Um, and it's also something that um, we could talk about. We could we could we could see we could see if they wanted to talk about that. Um, how is this for you? Seeing me in my home. Um, how is it for you to be in your home? See if they sort of get near that. Um, but I think Irving Yalom is one of my favorite therapists. I actually have a quote from him a little bit later um, in these slides. And what he always says is just to never forget that patients, um, you know, that we, we all have like, our, or they all have like their fantasies about us. Um, and we do too when we're patients, right? Like I've been in therapy a bunch in my life, right? That's why I'm a therapist. I believe in therapy. Um, and I too, right, have these ideas about the therapist, especially ones I really connect with and like, like I sort of, you know, have their lives like pictured in my head. Um, and so it, it's not, it's not, it's not going to be different than, than what they initially assumed. But I, I'll tell you what I love about your comment, which is you're super empathetic. Like you're, you're thinking about how, you know, how, how will they feel about this? Um, and I'm sure that your um, clients are feeling that. I wanted to talk just for a second about emergencies. Um, when I, I did, I did a webinar on March 27th or I, I had been, uh, my, I have six people who work for me, six other consultants and we're all clinicians and um, we'd all been doing telehealth for like eight days or something like that. And we were getting so many questions from people and so many of them were about emergencies that we ended up doing a webinar on March 27th and, and just talking about like all of this stuff. And one of the things about emergencies that I just wanted to put out is that I think sometimes for therapists, and I include myself in this, we forget that the only information we have for, about our patients is from self-disclosure for the most part, right? Upwards of 95% of what we use to make assessments is self-disclosure. We might get a parent report. We might get a teacher report. Um, but we can hardly do anything with that unless we are able to build a sufficient relationship to have somebody self-disclose the very same thing to us. And so emergencies, which most of us I think think of in terms of someone being in danger, either abuse or being in danger to harm themselves, suicidal ideation, self-harm, et cetera. Um, we are dependent on self-disclosure in, in, to assess an emergency. And even if we assess one, and we say, I'm sending the police to your house, um, you know, because you are suicidal um, and we don't bring them along with that plan, then really the police come to their house. And I'm sure this has happened to many of you. Somebody says, I'm not suicidal. And the police leave. 
So when it comes to emergencies, my North Star is, yes, it's different with virtual um, care because we need to know where they are. So part of the consent, um, which I also have at the end of this, um, webinar just in case anybody wants some wording for the consent and it's in it's in Spanish as well on that website that Jessica shared um, but my my sort of North Star is to really build a sufficient relationship where we can accurately assess you know tell me tell me you know tell me how you're feeling tell me what's going on for you and where we can um, bring people along to our plan you know I'm really worried about this. Let me tell you what I'm thinking about this. I'm wondering if, if you know, you would get better care and be safer some, in some place right now. Tell me your thoughts about that. Because I think if we get too anxious about it and we try to move too quick, we actually are completely foiled in being able to help because of this complete dependence on self-disclosure. So we do have to know where they are and we need to document that so that we ask up front, you know, um, are you at home? You know, no, I'm at grandma's house. Where's grandma's house? Um, so we do need to know that. And, um, and of course, we can only provide services to people who are in California. Um, and barring that, we need to know what the emergency services are in our area in which we're providing service, right? In some areas, some services are dramatically reduced in terms of emergencies. In some areas, those services are actually have gone, are more robust now. So we do have to know that. Um, I have a draft agreement for uh, behavioral health providers who are seeing patients from home. And one of the draft agreement things in there says, I will stay current for emergency services in my area and have all of those numbers on hand. Um, so that is a little bit different from working when we're working around a bunch of other people where we can just step out of our office and say, you know, I've got an emergency here and start to sort of bring in a team to sort of help with that. We don't have that same um, possibility. So the reliance on relationship and again on, 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 on that kind of empathic connecting and ensuring that somebody feels safe enough to self-disclose to us so we can make accurate assessments, knowing where they are, which we can do at the beginning of session, um, at all sessions, and then having making sure that we're super apprised of the emergency availability of services in our area is super important. I know um, because we're, uh, I really want to leave time. I'm seeing people chat in and um, really want to leave time for some discussion. I just wanted to go through just a couple like kind of off the cuff things that I felt like I learned really early on about doing therapy on the phone, which is um, I cannot remember the last time I talked on the phone and didn't do something else. Uh, if I'm talking on the phone, I'm cleaning the house, <laughs> like mopping the floors. I'm walking around. I'm driving. Um, and so all of a sudden, when it seemed like phone, you know, when, when people, so a lot of people don't have video or didn't have video, that I was trying to do sessions on the phone, all of a sudden I was like, gosh, what? I mean, my attention span has gone completely, you know, towards ADD in the last 10 years, I think like everybody else's. And I just had to really get like get into a therapist mode about like, what am I going to do to make sure that I can be present because connection only happens in the present. And I am my only tool. Like I, like we said, well, like I, it, it's me, like we have to connect in order to help. And so what I started noticing is that um, I can't look at anything else when I'm talking on the phone. I certainly cannot look at my computer. Um, I can't look around at the house. Um, I sometimes walk, but I can't look around while I'm walking. I have to look down. And so I've gotten into this habit of when I'm talking on the phone for a session that I just sit and look at my lap. That's what I mean by starving the eyes. And it brought me back to my early relationship with um, my, it's actually my ex-husband, but um, we, uh, when we were first dating, it was a long distance relationship. It was before smartphones and computers. Um, it was like 30 years ago and we were super in love and I'm sure any of you who've been super in love and been long distance on the phone, when you're talking to someone, you're trying so hard to connect with them. Like you're really just looking down and trying to like get through the phone to them. And it kind of brought me back to those times. Like, yeah, it isn't a romantic love, obviously with our patients, but it has some similarities to that. 
like the level of focus um, and not and, and looking down so, so that the rest of your senses can sort of open up and really feel this person. And I also noticed when I had headphones on that I had a tendency to want to do something with my hands. So I started holding the phone, kind of old school, holding the phone. This was why I called this, why can't I stop looking at myself? So um, I noticed that uh, when I was doing video sessions, I couldn't stop looking at myself and I was so embarrassed about it. I was so embarrassed about it that it took me like a week and a half to talk about it to my colleagues who are also therapists because I was like, well, what if they're not doing this too? <laughs> like, what, you know, I mean, it's not, not like I'm looking at myself. I mean, you know, I was like, man, I look like I'm 50, you know, <laughs> I mean, it wasn't necessarily positive, but I just, I was so embarrassed about it. And when I mentioned it to my colleagues, they were like, oh my gosh, I'm having the same experience. So I went through like the Zoom, the GoToMeeting, the Google Duo, um, the FaceTime and figured out how to unshow my own face so they can see me, but I can't see me. Now, some people get nervous about that because you're kind of monitoring maybe yourself and your facial expressions. For me, it was such a relief because when we're doing therapy with people, we can't see ourselves normally. So we can just focus deeply on the person in front of us. And now all of a sudden, when we're trying to do that, here's this picture of ourselves up here. Um, so that this has become really important to me. In managing alerts, this is my phone. Two mornings in a row, this is a screenshot of my phone. I'm sure yours looked the same. The first time I did a session on Google Duo, I was on my phone, they were on their phone, the video app for Androids, and um, these um, alerts kept popping up. And again, like that is kryptonite for us as therapists. Like mindful, accepting, curious focus is our medicine. That is the medicine that we provide. And as I was seeing these alerts come in, I just, I told the person, I have to stop. I have to fix something. I have to call you back. Like it was so distracting. Um, so now I turn off my alerts um, before sessions. Um, I just, this is the therapist that I love so much. I'm sure many of you know him. He's considered the father of group therapy. He now is the clinical consultant. He's almost 90. He's the clinical consultant for Talkspace, which is a text therapy app, which I'm super interested in and do some text therapy. Um, and I just wanted to end with this slide and just um, say that I think one of the magic things about this moment, the possible gifts of this moment, one of them is that sometimes we have like an illusion that we're maybe really different from, from our patients or clients. And I think all of us have that, especially if you're working in the safety net, socioeconomically, we're insulated from some of the, social, uh, the economic hardships of our patients. Um, sometimes, you know, there's this feeling that like they're really troubled and we're sort of the helpers. And I know that's true, like our role, like our role is as a helper when, when we're interacting with our patients. And so I think we forget that that's just our role and that, you know, when we take that shirt off, we put on the patient shirt to someplace else, or we put on the like struggling parent shirt. <laughs> Um, and, and our patients put on other shirts too. Like they, they get on their shirt and they go, you know, um, play soccer and are caretakers for their families. And, and so I think if we forget that they're just roles that we meet at in that moment and they're not, you know, they're not who we are, sometimes we forget that we really are just fellow travelers um, with the people that we're helping. And this pandemic, although we're insulated for some of the economic hardships, I think many of us are, we're, we're, otherwise we're going through the exact same things, the level of anxiety, the fear about the people who are more vulnerable in our lives, the economic uncertainty, the anxiety of the sort of topsy-turvy world, and it's uncommon. We're rarely going through the exact same thing as our patients, and so I do think that it's a possible, you know, really deep gift in this, in this moment. Um, this was something that was taped up on a storefront really near my house, and my son loves this. In fact, um, we didn't even tear one off because he said, no, no, I want to leave it. I want to leave it for others. And so I took take a picture of this, and this is just to circle back to Jessica saying, like, take what you need or is useful and leave the rest. Um, that's what this was for. Um, so what... Um, why don't I just stop and ask Jessica, are there questions or comments that have come in that you'd like to feed back? Yeah, thank you so much um, for this. Uh, there is a question about um, getting specific telehealth consent um, so far. Um, 
And so someone says that they have only been doing phone check-ins because prior to um, the shelter in place, they didn't have something signed um, that allowed them to do telehealth. Yeah, really super good point. So um, two things on that. This is, there, there is no specific wording that came from the state or federal government. <clears throat> there was specific um, uh, guidance about what consent had to include and um, my colleagues and I made this wording, and it's also translated into Spanish um, on that website. Um, the only, so, so you can use this, I'll, we only need verbal consent. We don't actually need signed consent, uh, we need verbal. Uh, so this is from the, this is at the beginning of the session, and then if you're not using HIPAA compliant communication, because this one is actually for, while we are using a HIPAA compliant approved mode of protected communication, et cetera, et cetera, if you're using one that's not HIPAA compliant, like the Google Duo, like I've been using, um, then you just say, we are, um, while we, we are using a non-HIPAA compliant approved mode of protected communication, you would just add the non in there. Um, but then you just document the verbal consent. Concurrently, um, what I'm doing with FQ8, like I work with a lot of community health centers, what I'm doing is we're sharing this, the consent, um, for a cut and paste for everyone to put this in their documentation. Yes, we gave verbal consent. And I'm suggesting that everybody add this to their consent to treat um, immediately. And so, so that going forward, every person who's actually walking in the door in person is signing a consent to treat that includes telehealth services so that we're laying the groundwork as time goes on. But for right now, it just needs to be verbal. Thank you. And then there um, was a question about um, the platforms that um, are available. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, uh, as things are changing so fast, right? They're changing day to day. Um, and so I, that's my sort of caveat about this, is this is the most updated that I know. Um, I've been using um, Zoom for healthcare and I've been using Doxy and Doximity. And for those of you who might be doing outreach calls to your families and they're not picking up, Doximity, um, Doxy, which the, the two are related, um, you can download the Doximity to your cell phone and you can put in the school-based health center phone number and call your family with your own phone and it shows up as the school-based health center. Um, so we started doing that at my clinic because we were getting many more people picking up when we did that. So that's just a little bit of an aside that can be super helpful. Um, and these are temporary, temporarily allowable platforms in the middle, and these are a lot of the ones that I'm using now. Thank you. And then there um, was a question about any tips on engaging uh, kids, younger kids, uh, elementary age? Yeah, um, I should have said this up front, and I'm sorry that I didn't. I think I'm not completely I think I'm embarrassed about it, that I didn't mention it sooner, which is, um, I don't think anybody knows how to engage younger kids right now at all. Mm -hmm. And um, right now, CPCA, the California Primary Care Association, um, for those of you who work at federally qualified health centers that are running the school-based health centers um, that you're in, um, they just started like a think tank, like a think group for engagement of young children in virtual care. And so if any of you are actually at community health centers and are interested in being a part of that, I would email CPCA because they're working on um, those best practices. But really, I, young kids are not my specialty clinically even. I, I only work with 13 and up. I've never had a specialty with 13 and under. Um, and I would say that all of you are generating the learnings as we speak, like all of you are. And I would encourage all of you to kind of continually write down and meet with each other and sort of elevate these learnings. Talk to your colleagues, find out what other people are seeing and noticing um, and, and write something down and circulate it and do a webinar with your colleagues. Because I think that part of this field, even though it's only been like 60 days or something like that, that part is the most nascent Mm -hmm. and the most undeveloped, and I don't think anybody is sure about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. 
Oh, this is so great. I find games, reading books, and sharing visuals very helpful. Love that. Yeah. Um, and then there was another question around um, how to encourage students to stay in positive daily routine of self-care. Um, yeah. This time. Yeah. My kids are really struggling. Mm -hmm. And so when I, when I, I, you know, I think that using like my own family and kids as a lab um, is really helpful because I also get to repeatedly see what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Which is me kind of freaking out that my daughter hasn't left the house for a walk in three days and projecting into the future about her depression mm -hmm. um, and um, feeling bad about myself as a parent that they, they don't seem to be able to engage in like healthy, you know, all of that stuff. So back to kind of how I opened in this um, webinar, I just want to reinforce what I know we all know. I just want to reinforce that there is no possibility of influencing behavior changes unless we are connected empathically with someone. That mm -hmm. is the field in which behavior change occurs. Mm -hmm. And so um, I have this, um, I, I feel like I'm better with clients and patients than I am with my own kids. But I had this breakthrough with my daughter because I think I'm always practicing that with clients. Um, you always want them to disclose to you that they're concerned about their own health. Because mm -hmm. if we are pushing, pushing, pushing. We know from motivational interviewing that that instantly, all of us, adolescents have it really strong, but we all have the psychological resistance reaction to being pushed when we mm -hmm. feel like there's a lack of autonomy and someone's pushing us, someone's shooting us. Um, and part of that's because we should ourselves all the time. And so then when we hear it from outside, like we push back. Um, so the, the most important thing is those motivational interviewing strategies where we're saying to people, how are you feeling about your health right now? Those wide open questions and like waiting and seeing if we can hear any shred of unhappiness about that and then feeding that back. It sounds like for the most part, you feel really good about it. You're a little bit worried about your eating. Can you tell me more about that? Mm -hmm. Right. Because the rule of motivational interviewing is anything you want to say to somebody, figure out how to help them say it. Mm -hmm. Not you. Um, mm -hmm. So I was, I was driving with my daughter to a coffee shop, <laughs> a coffee drive through and um, she said to me something like, I said, how are you feeling today? Like I was really wide open. I was in like full empathic mode. I was like kind of at my best, which I don't feel like I have been because I've been so scared about her health. And um, I, but I was wide open and I think she picked it up and she said, oh, you know, I mean, I don't want Scotland to happen again. She was basically referring to last year we moved to Scotland and she got really, really, really depressed. And it was a really scary time for her and for us. And um, I said, oh, I didn't realize that you were worried about that. Tell me more. And then she just proceeded to tell me, I know I know, I should be leaving the house every day. It's just so hard to have. You know, she proceeded to kind of talk this through. And I just thought to myself, God, just reminding myself to use, like, the, the best skills I have with my own kids, you know. Mm -hmm. It's harder to come to mind the fear. Mm -hmm. um, but our only chance to influence that our only chance is when people feel like we're not pushing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And um, I just wanted to point out that I did post a few um, resources. They were actually from Leora from the Mental Health Technology um, Transfer Center uh, around telehealth that are coming out. As you said, this is a new field and we're all um, figuring this out as, as we go. Um, and in light of MI, and I know we've just a little bit of time left, but if there are any um, evidence-based practices that you feel like translate well to telehealth that um, could get feedback on, or that was a question that came up. Yeah. I love, yeah, a motivational interviewing, which mm -hmm. is sort of trans-theoretical, right? Mm -hmm. It can be used with CBT, with mm -hmm. sort of, you know, it's, it's trans, um, it, it follows at anywhere, anything, and I'm a huge fan of, and it's empathy-based. It's completely based on being shoulder to shoulder mm -hmm. and creating a connection with someone in which we can be helpful while somebody weighs out changing their behavior. Um, I think is works 
excellent in my experience on mm -hmm. phone on the phone and we actually have a bunch of research earlier you know on the impact study and things like that about um, motivational interviewing type interventions on the phone that have worked really well for decades but I also think they work really well virtually. Um, I just put this back up. Um, I'm always like a little self-conscious, like I'm not selling anything, everything's free. <laughs> um, but uh, I have a bunch of motivational interviewing resources on here too. Um, I know there's a lot out there as well. I just mm -hmm. wanted to, to share that. Thank um, you, that's helpful. Yeah, someone asked for the site again. Good. So thank you. I know we're at the very end and yeah. um, I know Jessica's gonna close. I just wanted to say, even though I can't, I can't see everybody, I just, I just wanted to thank you all for being here. Um, and like I'm sending like a, a virtual hug mm -hmm. to my colleagues out there. Yes, and thank you, Elizabeth, so much for your time and all of the great um, things that you shared today. And um, in closing, I just wanna let everybody know that there's gonna be an evaluation that will automatically pop up um, on your screen. It's five um, questions. If you could please um, fill it out, that would be so helpful. Um, and if you have any um, further questions or um, uh, I'm getting to if, Elizabeth, if you could pass it to me. Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> that's okay. Um, if you have any further questions or um, comments, uh, you can email um, us and go to our website for um, a link to the um, uh, this, this webinar and then also to register for the upcoming webinar. And that's I think that brings us to the end. Thank you so much, Jessica. Thank you. Thank you, everyone out there. Okay. Bye. Bye.